So begins Cemetery Road, Greg Isle's most captivating and propulsive novel to date. Marshall McEwen is one of the most successful journalists in Washington, D.C., but as a chaotic presidential administration lifts him from print fame to television stardom, Marshall discovers that his family is terminally ill, his father, and he must return to his childhood home, a place he vowed he would never go back to. The infield Mississippi is no longer the city Marshall remembers. His family's 150-year-old newspaper is failing and Jet Talal, the love of his youth, has married into the family of Max Matheson, one of a dozen powerful patriarchs who rule the town through the exclusive Bienville Poker Club. To Marshall's surprise, the Poker Club was offered economic salvation to this community on the brink of extinction in the form of a billion-dollar Chinese paper mill. But on the verge of the deal's consummation, two deaths rock Bienville to its core, threatening far more than the city's economic future. You want me to love you, but you don't love me now. Why should I give my heart to you? We gonna shut that motor down. I've been searching for you for a long time now, but you've left my heart's vision. Now you want me to stay in your life. That won't happen again. No, you said no. No, can't blame you. No, that's why I like that book. Yeah, when you gonna shut that motor down? I have been searching for you. Yes, I like that book. It's up on you now. My name is Charlie Crawford, and this is I like that book, aka Charlie Crawford from the heart. And today I got it. I got a damn good book. It is this, Cemetery Road by the main man, Greg Isles. This book took me by surprise, man. I was um, I was very, very pleasantly surprised how thoroughly researched and, and, and expertly structured this book was. It came off kind of, you know what I mean, to the untrained eye as too long. And maybe to the expert eye, it was too damn long because it was long as hell. But it was um, it was a book that had you on the edge of your seat the entire time. Man, like stakes just kept building and building and building. Now I've heard of this 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 author, man. Like um, every time I go to a bookstore, I see his book Natchez Burning, I believe. Um, that series on the shelves, whether it's uh, a library, a book a uh, bookstore. Or just a you know a regular uh, B and M uh, used bookstore, but the point is, you know, I always thought it was more like historical fiction and stuff like that. And of course, in a sense, it kind of is, but they're more so thrillers, man, uh, that radiate deep, deep drama-like uh, concepts to them, where it's kind of like a TV show. It's um it's not episodic in a sense, but the way that he structures the the, the the all of the different things that the the main characters have to go through it's kind of like a tv show you want to keep on turning the page turn the page keep on going to the next episode blah 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 and um it was very very satisfying to get through a book like this from the beginning man i just enjoyed that it started right and uh how they say media media rest the, you know it started right in the middle of action and it wasn't so much the main action, but everything that the novel was gonna build upon was, was from that scene. And um, I like how it makes you care about every single character. Oh man, he digs deep into the characters. Between each action point, there's uh, slow uh, uh, moments uh, for character building and, and getting to understand them. And so you got that matched with the, the suspense and the thrill of the entire uh, uh, pacing and things like that. It's, it's keeping you hooked right from the get-go. And from that beginning scene, the antagonist, this the sort of antagonist, were, were brought up right away. I'm talking about page one. I also enjoyed that the setting, man, and, and all that it encompasses is a war zone. And, and it's basically uh, just filled with tension from the get-go. It's a great setting for a book like this. You can never really get settled in or, or feel that your characters are safe. It's incredibly deep and saddening, you know, the way that he writes about the past, right? It makes it feel like it's the uh, the reader's tragedy, the way that it's, it's written. And of course, that's just that's just experts' uh, style of writing. 
you know what I mean? You get the, the reader to feel how you want them to feel or um, basically elicit emotions, deep emotions that's going to stay with them long after the end. And um, I thought that was a, um, a five star level skill that, um, you know, many can have, but not, not many obtain. Um, and that's just goes to show his talent, his skill, and probably his work ethic as well when it comes to his craft. And the book has many, many powerful subplots. It's not too many that is going to overwhelm you or deter you and make you not think that the book is cohesive. Because it is. With a book like this set off in the, in the Deep South and around this time with a lot of the damn themes that it has on. I, I got a few triggers and, again, themes that, you know, I took away from it. A lot of it are uh, survivor's guilt, regret, depression, loss of loved ones, uh, heartbreak, jealousy, revenge. Uh, collateral damage seeking when you're seeking justice uh, selling out versus righteousness it's a long list of things that you know what I mean if this was a book club you know I would love to, to sit around for an hour and just discuss the many dynamics and, 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 and philosophies and ideologies and uh, and things like that of this book just another incredibly raw book you know I, I enjoyed all ex exposition you know what I mean I enjoyed all action I enjoyed all character building I enjoyed everything from um, the setup all the way to the uh, the fall of action. You know, he is he is such a, a wizard at um, moral dilemma and, uh, and conflict, right? It's like each web of chaos that every character is in is far from elementary or, or, or trivial. It's something incredibly deep where if you choose that right there, the entire side of that building with the children is going to fall. Or if you choose this one right here, say goodbye to your parents. And they're good people. They're good people. Just an example. That didn't happen. None of that happened in the book. But it's stuff where, you know what I mean, we care to keep reading. They're complex. They're complex and shrouded in the, the, the discolorization. It ain't just, you know, gray and white. It's just all kind of colors of the many things that we struggle with in this life. You know, to me, man, it's just... This book is like the personification or the epitome of what the root of all evil being the love of money looks like. This book right here, it can grow legs and it'll be the personification of what the root of all evil is. When you love money, oh man, it's basically going to exaggerate the kind of person you are. A lot of us are just trucked up. I'm a truck driver. So I say we trucked up people and that's going to exacerbate and it's going to cause a novel like this to happen. But I think he's also a master of pace. And this is the first time I read uh, Greg Isles. And, um, you know, I just think he manipulates time and space to, to make the reader feel how you want to feel. For example, if there's a, a, a moment where Marshall, our main character, needs to be on high alert. For example, if he's uh, walking to his car or if he's driving five blocks, oh, 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 Arthur Greg Isles is going to, um, you know, basically hyperbolize the minute things, right? You know what I mean? The, the, the thing that might increase paranoia in Marshall or in us to make us feel how you want us to feel, right? And to, to, to give us that, that increase of the stakes and the suspense and things like that just just a master at his art what i found that basically irked me to my very soul the most about this this book and specifically the antagonists this poker club all of these powerful men is that they do things and they act and they walk around like they're many gods right like as if they don't bleed and and and, and, and can possibly go through the same stuff that me and you could right they walk around like many gods and it, it just brings off brings off of just a just a nasty taste in anybody in anybody mouth man because it's like the audacity of mankind as if the wrath of God can't come down on them like that and sometimes it don't happen like that and so that's what irks you when you're the little man and you gotta you gotta basically be subjected to however these evil corrupt people want to be and it makes it makes it seem like you know books like this is basically a microcosm of the world at large which is probably why we always have this heavy blanket of, of evil spirit just lingering on this world, man. What say you? You know, a lot of times when Marshall was getting bribed by these people, he was being told by them they're not in, in the game to, to, 
you know, change the world. They're only in it for business, profit. For me, I just think it's just too many quotes to, uh, to, to basically do justice to that side. But I will give a few, like basically um, there was one where uh, corruption is basically the part of capitalism or how we feel about raw paralyzing fear and what it does to us or beauty is the currency of popularity there's one in its entirety that i like the thing about kicking open the door to the past is that sometimes what's behind it comes out under its own power you can try to run but no matter how fast you do you're dragging your demons behind you at a certain point you might as well stop turn and let them roll over you and fold you if you're lucky Maybe they'll die in the light of day. It's pretty dark right there. Pretty deep too. All I can say is stakes, stakes, stakes. They rise so high in this book, sometimes it don't feel like Marshall even have oxygen to breathe. Near him, nowhere near him. Hit them back. Jab them with a sharp stick and let them know they're mortal. They have to obey the rules like everybody else or they go down. To admit, this one statement about humanity should be. It says most people sell their souls one piece at a time. You know, I enjoy Marshall McEwen. Um, you know, I wrote down here, it says, McEwen knows when he should keep his mouth shut, but his hatred for them is so ferocious that he always uh, speaks his mind. He's a journalist, but lives like the most badass man who ever lived. And a lot of times we have those in fiction, but you know, that's why we relate to those characters because he's normal but he, he happens to be incredibly brave in the traits where it, it takes him to try and go after and take out, take out something like the poker club is, is something that we all wish we can um, basically um, climb the mountain to become. Here, here's the quote about vanity that I love as well. It's vanity, not pride. And vanity is a low thing. Vanity is a weakness. That which is crooked cannot be made straight and that which is wanting cannot be numbered there's no meaning to be found in tragedy only in our response to it what we do matters nothing else and to end i think that this um this novel man it, it, it leads to a satisfying climax and ending and um and so i won't i won't i won't i'll try not to go too deep but there's our there's a few takeaways that i'll leave with you guys to basically contemplate on yourself man one day if I'm able to uh, market this this channel or even try to get it out there, you know, or even have people read the dang on, or not read, but just, you know, tune in, maybe I can do a, a book club, man, because I would love to just, you know, not so much host, but be a part of a book club. It's kind of hard to do it as a trucker, but, you know, live streaming are out there. You know, there was a mortician, I believe it was a mortician, uh, the guy who does the, you know, do the uh, local autopsies and stuff like that. Uh, Byron Ellis in the book and um, at one point him and Marshall McEwen Marshall being white Brian Ellis being black uh, they were talking in the, uh, the war in the city between the black youth was brought up and um, it, it, it got me to thinking man it's kind of shameful and uh, embarrassing right if your, your group of people is always the ones hurting themselves you know uh, acting all crazy and stuff like that and seemingly in a downward spiral it was embarrassing, but the thing is, it wasn't so much embarrassing that we're, we're in that plight. It's just, you get tired of hearing about the same things without solutions, specifically by your own people, right? And so I think when all that washed away, man, when that shame or whatever washed away, um, I was kind of, I kind of again got happy that even in fiction, our plight is mentioned, right? Because um, something that atrocious, you know, even though it is atrocious, bringing light to it is always a good thing. Always a good thing. And so uh, we shouldn't be, uh, you know, filled with shame or even embarrassment at the end of the day. It is something that needs to be tackled and it's something that needs to be brought up every single time it happens. We, we just, you know, me specifically, but I know I speak for all my people. We want this shit to stop. We want it to stop. One of the... Um, the motifs in this story is uh, uh, Marshall's relationship with his father, who is practically on his deathbed the whole damn book. But, um, you know, something happened. You know, Marshall's brother uh, passed very early. Um, you know, something happened where Marshall 
and his father were on the outs. They were on the outs. And, um, you know, at 15 years old, um, you know, another man took over sort of the father figure in Marshall's life. And it made me just think, man, it'd be nice if we all defaulted um, as doing that where we see a young man or a young woman, you know, a, a woman reach out for the young woman, a man reach out for the young man, and we reach out and we and we fill in where maybe the biological or the, the legal um, guardians couldn't have. It'd be a much better world and the youth would be much better for it. As long as you a productive role model, of course. I also like when Marshall described books as those musty relics of the 20th century. And that's a good way to describe it to people that don't read it or either even these young people who just go straight to the you know the source of uh electronics but as you can see i got my thing right here i do like libby and i do like audiobooks but these musty relics of the 20th century will always make me happy always make me happy another quote if your dad doesn't come around it's because he doesn't want to that's got nothing to do with you he's missing something in his character divorce is one thing leaving a wife but a man who leaves his children is something else. I've got no respect for a man who does that. A man who leaves his children does damage that can never be repaired. One thing I do want to mention, man, it's not talked about in a lot of romance or even uh, love um, sort of um, conversations, um, but staying together with somebody and having long, long years with them for a long, long time, especially through uh, tough times and you guys had to fight through adversity together um that's also just as sexy that's just as sexy as um being the right kind of person um as uh meeting on a uh, a bridge in the middle of the sunlight uh in the middle of a sunset um having a group of friends together and all that stuff everything that's sort of surrounded with the um the sort of the usual idea of a great love story I think when you have a lot of time together, take that as, as a, a, a sort of bullet point to put under all of those pros because that's a damn sexy thing when you see people together for a long time. When getting robbed by these, these, these monsters at the poker club, right, um, Marshall was often told that they're not in the game for uh, changing the world, saving the world. They're in it to, they're all about making money, right? They're all about business, they're all about profit. And it sort of made me just think, man, no matter who you are, no matter what kind of level of power or wealth you have, we should always be decent, all, all be decent people. Um, and, and how good of a world would that be, right? Of course you're not in the game to make uh, uh, the world better, stuff like that, if you're a business. That's the name of the game, you gotta make profits. But why can't you, you sort of uh, mix and match that with being a decent human being? Why? Because I feel like if you don't do that, the other side of your soul might try to fight to the surface whereas the decent side you deliberately pushing down and so um you know i see a lot of successful people who got a lot of uh hubris and, and ego problems and i just hope they don't they don't you know go anywhere near the kind of people these people at the poker club is also had a paradoxical uh love hate relationship with the um the very immoral uh love or you know basically love affair uh subplot that was going on in here and um it's kind of like when people um idolize those um abusive relationships in fiction and how the let's say for example the woman will go back with the man um it, it's kind of raw and real that it does happen in real life right these these love affairs and stuff like that with a husband or a wife you know what i mean going and being unfaithful um so i will respect the fact that that is real that it does happen but again it was idolized um i i desperately wanted that shit to stop i don't know you know what i mean i couldn't even enjoy the fun of it sometimes because i'm like okay they basically idolizing this and so it was just incredibly stupid of the characters and so that's pretty much a big subplot that's not a spoiler or anything like that and so it even mentions that in the blurb and so i also want to say this the worst moments of our life happens when we're not prepared or ready for them overall this is probably one of my favorite books of all time i'm not even gonna lie to you um i'm definitely gonna read the not just burning book uh this was long as hell but man i'm glad i got it it got that sort of um i think they call it deckled edges or whatever decked edges 
and uh, it makes it look again like a rusty relic of the rusty musty relic of the 20th century and so I enjoy that about the books as well oh man it smells like heaven I give it a five out of five stars I love this book um, everything about it just got a, a high high score for me and so I just wish that anyone who read this book can slow down um, there are many takeaways and the quotes and the plot and the character development and even just the takeaways that I mentioned here and, um, and I think anybody can learn from a book like this and they can they can still away from their their normal day and just go ahead and, and, and enjoy a book like this so if you read it I hope you enjoy it and so that that be the review the cemetery rule Greg Isle and my name is Charlie Ray Crawford and I'm gonna truck off of on the road I'm that And now it's time to say goodbye. Mm. Won't you please come back and say hi hi? Thank mm -hmm. you.